Good morning. Thank you for joining me again today. And I just hope and pray that you have a good week in Jesus Christ. We're going to start a rather fascinating chapter today, Mark chapter 6. And we begin with the fact that Jesus went back into his hometown of Nazareth, and there he went into the synagogue and taught. Let's listen to the word of God, Mark 6 verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard Jesus were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's the wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could do no mighty works there, except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone back to your home church, but I had to before I went into ministry. When I was in England, I had to preach in my home church. And at the time, I was not very saved. I was not very repentant. I was rather a rebellious gentleman in my 20s, and I had to go back to preach there before I could be ordained by my denomination. And I remember the dean of my college writing to my minister and saying, hasn't Richard ever preached? How can you ordain a man you've never heard? Well, it was a big church for England, and it was well attended. And quite obviously, I was not the one to preach on a Sunday. But if they were going to ordain me, they were going to have to listen to me. So on a Sunday evening, I was invited to preach. Now, in England at that time, our services were attended better in the evening than they were in the morning. It's reversed since then. But I had this experience of going back to the church in which I was brought up. The church in which they still remembered me in my baby carriage. Now, I've given my baby carriage up for some years now, but people still see you as you were, and it was not easy. And then afterwards, I was going back home, and my brother was there, and my mother, and my mother said, Richard, did all that come out of your head? Well, you know how mothers are. And I said, well, mum, there's nothing new under the sun. But it was a strange experience. It was not easy. And because I was rebellious, I said things I shouldn't have said. I took some shots at people. Since then, the Lord has been gracious to teach me a number of things. You don't do that from the pulpit. But by the same token, it was a difficult one. Jesus had a similar experience. He goes back to Nazareth, he teaches on the Sabbath, and obviously his teaching was something totally different than they had heard from anyone else. As it says elsewhere in the Gospels, he taught with authority, not as the scribes. The scribes had no authority. They hadn't got anything. Jesus had it. He spoke in a totally different way. But more than that, miracles took place while he was there. And then the question was asked, isn't he the carpenter? And really, as you listen to that, there was a slur in it. They looked down on the carpenter. They knew Jesus from the carpenter's shop. They had been in there and he had done work for them. And who does he think he is to come back and preach? Who does he think he is to do these miracles? And by the way, isn't his family here? Now, if you come from the Roman Catholic faith, and we've mentioned this before on this program, uh, many of you have not seen that Jesus did have half-brothers and sisters, and here they're named, and Mary's name too. Isn't this Mary's son? We know Mary, we know the brothers and sisters. They don't do these things. Who does he think he is? And you see the problem. You see the difficulty. But I think the real thrust comes right at the end there, at the beginning of verse 6. Verse 5 two. Jesus could not do many miracles there, except he lay hands on a few sick people and healed them. Then verse 6, the first line. 
And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, friend, if Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, you know it was bad. But by the same token, hear what's being said. Because there was lack of faith, Jesus could not do many miracles. And that, to me, speaks volumes for the church of Jesus Christ today. If you go into most morning services, if you go into the Mass, not too many of us are there expecting the Lord to visit us and work His miracles. And that's where the church of Jesus Christ is lacking. We need to attend our services with expectation. We need to attend with faith. We need to expect to see Him doing mighty things. We ex should expect the supernatural to be the natural in our services on Sundays or in our Bible studies or whenever God's people come together. It happened then and it can happen now. Over the years, to some extent, we've educated ourselves out of miracles. These things don't happen today. Oh yes, they do. Jesus has not changed. The power of the Holy Spirit has not changed. And we can expect miracles today. Understand that and watch for it. But we don't finish there. We go on to find that Jesus sent out the twelve disciples. It says in the second part of verse 6, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out by two and two, and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now this is a very beautiful passage. Notice one or two very special things. Jesus called his twelve to him, and he sent them out with his authority. That's the point. They were working under the authority of Jesus. And I believe that everyone who's ordained in the name of Jesus Christ should go out under the authority of the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's when things happen. That's when we see the action. Now notice something else. They were sent out two by two. That's the principle of Jesus' work. That's the principle of the gospel story. Jesus sent them out in twos. And I think in that there's something very vital. First of all, while one's working, the other's praying. Secondly, there is support in fellowship. And when we have to work on our own, there are times when it can get very tough. We can't talk about it. We can't share everything we do. It is not easy. And I've said to you before and I say again, often your minister your priest, whether you're Roman Catholic or Protestant, they have lonely lives. It is not easy. They cannot share many of the things they're told. If they did, they would break a trust. They cannot do it. Now notice what Jesus told them to take. They were not to take anything for the journey. No money, no food. It would be provided. Now that's faith. And this was a faith mission. And there are many faith missions today. Now, it doesn't mean that faith missions are wrong. It doesn't mean those who work in a different way are wrong. We should work the way the Lord our God has shown us. In this particular case, there were particular instructions. Notice also in verse 11 that if a place did not welcome them, they were to shake the dust off their feet, a testimony against that town. And straight away, God's face will be set against them because God's representatives were not accepted. They went out and preached that people should repent. Will you take a real thought here? Always in the gospel story, first there was the preaching of the gospel, there was the repentance from sin, and then things began to happen. And so often within our churches and within our preaching, we try to go the other way. Sometimes we try to see the miracles before the preaching. Notice the order. The preaching came. The repentance came. And when that took place, then other things happened. And what happened? Verse 13 tells us, They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them.
As we see so often in Jesus' day, first of all, the demonic had to be dealt with. Until the demons had been dealt with, the person could not be set free. And it has not changed one scrap over the centuries. There are still people bound up by evil spirits. You know it, you see it, you may not acknowledge it, but it's there. The sad fact is it can be true for a Christian believer. We too can be bound up. Some people will tell you that when you're saved, all that is taken care of. I wish it were. It is not, at least it's not for me, and it's not for some other people that I've prayed with. And it may well be true for you. You are a Christian, you do love the Lord, but you're still gummed up with things that came to you before you accepted Jesus Christ. And you haven't been set free. And it's rough and it's difficult. And you need help. Also, they anointed sick people with oil and healed them. We see this elsewhere in the Gospels. We see it in the letter of James, right at the end there in James 5, that we are to anoint the sick with oil, to pray believing, and they will be healed. Now, there's a principle here again. As we anoint with oil, it is a picture of the Lord our God anointing with the Holy Spirit, and as he anoints with his Spirit, so people are healed. It is the healing power of his Spirit. It's not the oil. Don't ever think there's anything magical in oil. I remember one person said, will you please anoint me with this oil? It comes from Israel. Or will you please anoint me with this oil? It comes from Oral Roberts. Well, of course I will. But it's not the oil that matters. We see in these verses, it is the faith that matters. And then secondly, it is as we pray, believing as that faith is expressed, God's power works. And remember, whenever you're praying in this sort of way, you never know what God will do. He remains the healer. He remains sovereign. It is in his wisdom. And things do happen. But we have to accept that he does what he wants to do. Sometimes you hear someone praying, and I did on a radio program the other day, praying for someone, Lord, if it's your will, make them better. Now, first of all, we ought to have some idea of God's will before we pray. And secondly, often we add that as a sort of P.S. in case we're not too sure what's going to happen. I think we have to be careful of that. If the Gospels tell us that Jesus healed the sick, Jesus still does today, and we can be confident in that.